And um, yeah, I've, I've had a great life for the last four decades working with a whole range of children across the spectrum of neurodiversity. In those days, the word autism didn't really exist in the same way it does now. Um, but I guess a lot of the children who are now in their 40s and 50s would be classed as autistic. I'd, I'd like to start by um, playing you a clip um, from a young, young woman now. She's a girl then called Romy. And Romy suffered catastrophic brain damage when she was uh, just born with a huge glucose overdose. And that um, knocked out the speech centers of her brain and quite a good deal else. But luckily, she had fantastically insightful parents who thought maybe music was something that Romy could use um, to communicate. And they got her one of those horrible little keyboards, I hate, where the keys light up when you press them in a sort of mechanical way. But of course, to Romy, he was struggling to make sense of the world because humans are very... Um, uh, we're always, we always behave differently, don't we? Whereas the keyboard was always the same. And so Romy um, always got a consistent response. And from that, she started to understand the world. And she started to play. Like lots of autistic children, she taught herself to play. She's hemiplegic, so she's kind of using one hand. And we're about three years into our relationship. You'll notice we've got two pianos because Romy sharing a keyboard isn't going to happen uh, initially. As Derek knows to his cost, he spends a lot of time playing with Romy. But the important point is to hear how Romy uses music as a proxy language. So as, as you watch the interaction, see the functions you can see that Romy is using music for instead of words. So on. Um, but you can see how Romy could disagree, she could agree, she could have a sense of shared ownership of the musical space. And above all, it's fascinating this morning comparing musical understanding and musical feeling and response. And you know, there's a kind of myth that autistic uh, children, autistic musicians don't, don't feel the music. Well, Romy is her, she's such an embodied uh, experience. You can see her um, absolutely electrified with, with the pleasure of particular sounds, particular chords, particular sequences. And being Romy, they don't diminish. So she'll still be there two hours later, still with the same electric excitement. So how can that be? Well, I'd like to, to build quite a different model from a sort of neuroscience one and think of the functionality, functionality of auditory 
development using an ecological sort of model, which obviously must have neurological correlates. But I guess one of the miracles of the human brain is that quite without any formal explicit education, we, the brain learns that there are three different main functions of sound in life. There's everyday sounds, um, music, which is the mystery that Darwin first thought about, and, and language, speech. And they're all processed in quite different ways. But what about the children on the autism spectrum, particularly those with a sort of classic or canner-type autism with the learning difficulties and the language delay? Well, there's a tendency to process sound as pure sound, not because of what it means, not because of its function. And in fact, the surveys of, of families we've done of young autistic children show this fascination with certain everyday sounds like vacuum cleaners, microwaves, car engines, and so on. And they're all sounds that have uh, musical qualities. Also, for anyone who's been around a school for children on the spectrum, you'll know that they, they love to flick things to, to make, uh, make them sound. And I'd like to introduce another friend of some long standing now, which is Freddie. Um, Freddie's about 10 years old in this um, clip. And his parents wanted me to, to see if we could do anything because much as they loved Fred very much indeed, um, he had this habit of fetching um, all the plant pots from his parents' lovely garden, emptying them all out and bringing them into the kitchen and constructing a sort of giant gamelan. Um, and they, I suppose there were two things really. First of all, why is he doing it? And second of all, can you stop him please? Um, <laughs> I rushed, when I heard, I rushed down with a video camera, and needless to say, Fred wasn't quite so interested. But nonetheless, you can, you can get the impression of what he's up to. That's how it should be. That's how it should be, isn't it? Look. So it's like for Fred, he's not hearing the sounds in an everyday way, he's hearing them in a musical way. In fact, now he's learned the names of the notes. He'll go around saying F sharp, G sharp. And actually, Derek, when you're on a plane, you're similar, aren't you? Yeah. You say, it's F sharp, Adam, we're coming, sharp, coming into land. So I think on the seven and a half hours chatting to Derek, or listening to Derek on the way over, um, I think, Derek, your experience was really of the fascination of the sounds the engines were making rather than the fact that we were going to land somewhere different. So if you think of um, music versus language processing, then understanding spoken language is a major challenge in children with um, classic autism. And no wonder it's hugely complex, isn't it? Developing language requires these huge mappings between blobs of sound and ideas or concepts and feelings. Whereas if you compare that with music, essentially music's just repetition of sounds. Uh, basically, the brain is saying, is it the same or different, and how much is it different? In fact, music's about 80% repetitive, at least. So it's highly redundant information. So it's much simpler for the brain to process than, than languages. And so that early, early childhood, when language doesn't mean much, but we're surrounded by musical sounds. No wonder it latches onto these patterns and regularities. So what sort of evidence might you look for that children with classic autism are indeed um, processing language in a musical way? Well, there are studies showing that autistic children tend to listen to the prosody of speech, its melodic qualities, rather than its meaning, its semantic properties. And of course, there's the re repetition of words and sounds found in echolalia, which again is typical of many children with classic autism. I got this off uh, an American YouTube channel, you'll be pleased to know. Um, it's great. Parents are fantastic, aren't they? They don't mind putting their children, um, showing off their latest things. And this little boy is extremely echolalic, as you'll hear. Ring, 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 ring. <laughs> 
Hayden. <laughs> ring, 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 ring. Ah. Hello. 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 <laughs> How are you today? <laughs> Hello. Yay. What? How's it going? I'm so What you doing today? What you doing? <laughs> what you doing? What you doing? What you doing? What you doing? Okay. And so on. You know, there was a time when echolalia was thought to be uh, almost damaging, really, preventing typical speech development. I think a more modern view is that it's a crucial, crucial stage in language development. And autistic children might well stay in it longer, but suppressing it certainly isn't going to, to help um, the more normal give and take of language. But it's as though speech, too, becomes processed as music. So in other words, uh, like when you were little, Derek, I think everyday sounds and language all became channeled into the music channel. So what are some of the consequences of that? Well, an obsession with pure sound leads to strong processing of the absolute perceptual qualities. And think of things like absolute pitch, which in most Western cultures is about one in 10,000 people. In the autism population, it's nearer 5%. And for some autistic children, it leads to this different way of hearing the world. People often ask me, well, how do you know if a nonverbal child has absolute pitch? And all I can say is, as I say to my wife, it's like being in love. You know it when it happens. Um, here's Fred again. Um, Freddie did eventually agree to uh, sit down at the piano and sort of have lessons. And the extraordinary thing of Fred is that he would sit at the piano and just touch the keys and sing the notes that he could hear. He didn't need to press the keys because he knew what they sounded like already. And so here's Fred uh, a little later um, doing some five finger exercises. I've shown him how to do. Good boy. Can you sing? He's actually singing the wrong notes at the moment. But you haven't done C minor. No, 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 I think Freddie's father by now thought both myself and Freddie were completely bonkers. I mean, he's got him a £4,000, $5,000 piano, and Freddie just pretends to play it all day long. <laughs> but of course, I explained it's redundant. Making the music is redundant for Fred because it's in his head already. Good. So we can start to build a sort of model of what's happening in early auditory development in children like Fred. So if you think of classic autism producing an exceptional early cognitive environment with problems with processing language and problems with understanding the functionality of everyday sounds, if you plug into that the ubiquity of music in young children's environments and the fact that music is about 80% repetitive, you get this tendency for many sounds that we would regard as non-musical to be processed in a musical way. For about 5% of children, that seems to lead to absolute pitch. For some, like Romy and Freddie, actually, and Derek when you were little, that music becomes a proxy language. And given the opportunity, the children will develop exceptional performing skills very often. Derek, you're coming on to the best bit about you. Yes, Anna. Yay. Derek, you've done really well. You haven't interrupted me once, because normally any jokes get um, spoiled because you predict them, don't you, Derek? So, Derek, you are, how old are you? 43, isn't it? Yeah. And you were born really premature for a 43-year-old, 26 weeks. 
there's a picture of you, Derek, that you know about of you in the incubator. And in those days, incubators were very primitive. They didn't have a way of measuring oxygen levels. So as you know, Derek, they had to take a tiny prick of blood out of the back of your hand, actually. Race across the hospital to measure the oxygen level, bring the result back. That took half an hour, and then they tweaked the oxygen. So it was, um, it was a miracle you survived, Derek, but you did. And you were raised by? Uh, Sister Wall, oh, yeah, she was, a, she was a nurse, wasn't she? But then Nanny came along. Yeah. And Nanny, just like Romy's family, thought, what can I do with this child who doesn't seem to be interested in anything? And she got you a little keyboard, didn't she? She did, Adam. And you taught yourself to play. I taught myself to play, Adam. And Derek, your favourite um, recording of you when you were about four years old, playing English Country Garden. Oh. Here we go. Do you know what, Derek? I think they find you more interesting than me. It's very, very helpful. <laughs> right, you've got a picture of you, Derek, when you were nine years old, playing at the Barbican. Playing at the Barbican. And here's a picture of you just before lockdown in Taiwan, doing what you do best, which is having great fun uh, playing music all over the world. So this was an autistic guy in Taiwan who played um, a piece I think he'd made up, and then you improvised on it, Derek. Mm -hmm. 